Chapter Fifteen of Against Odds by Lawrence L. Lynch. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Fifteen, The King of Confidence Men. I found a number of people at the big uptown hotel who could tell me a little of Gerald Trent, as he appeared to them after a few days' acquaintance, and these were unanimous in saying and believing that young Trent was not absent by his own will. It's a case of foul play, I'm sure of it, declared the clerk, to whom I had represented myself as acting for one of Mr. Trent's friends. Cal saw him at the viaduct, he told me, just before he left. That was five days ago now, and Trent was then going down to secure those rooms and see that they were put in order. He went by the suburban because he wanted to go over to the avenues, and Cowles went down by the whaleback. There was no more to be learned uptown. Gerald Trent had been last seen at the viaduct at the foot of Van Buren Street, where the cattle cars, the suburban, and numerous boats left the lake front and the wharf beyond en route for the fair city. This was at ten o'clock a.m., or near it. I went back to the fair city, as Trent had last gone, upon the suburban train and before noon had begun an exploration in the vicinity of the north entrance for the rooms engaged by him. Bounding the fair city on the west was the street known as Stony Island Avenue, and after a short survey of such near portions of this street as I had not seen, I satisfied myself that young Trent would not have selected it as a place of abode for his lady mother, his sister, and his sweetheart. One block westward, Running south from 57th was a short street called Rosalie Court, and after exploring this I pushed on to Washington Avenue, and then to Madison, running respectively one and two blocks parallel with Rosalie Court. Something impelled me to pass by Washington Avenue, upon which Miss Jenris and her aunt were lodged, and to explore the farther avenue first. If the rooms are within two or three blocks of the north entrance, I said to myself, and if they are upon this street, I shall find them within one block north or south from this corner, meaning 57th Street, and I turned southward and began my search in earnest. Not long since this part of the city had been a beautiful suburb, and the pretty cottages and more stately villas were, for the most part, isolated in the midst of their own grounds. Every other house, it seemed, and some of the most pretentious, bore upon paling, piazza, or doorposts, the legend Rooms to Let, and I applied and entered at a number of handsome and homelike portals, first upon the east side and then upon the west, crossing at 58th Street to turn my face northward. At 57th I paused. It is something more than two blocks from the fair entrance to this point, I mused, and therefore I ought to go but one block in this direction and when I had traversed the block to 56th Street with no success, I crossed the street and went on, saying, It's easy for a stranger to be mistaken in a matter of distance. At the north end of this square stood a large old-fashioned mansion of a decidedly southern type. It stood upon terraced grounds and was a dignified reminder of better days, with its stained and time-roughened stuccos and the warm paint about the ornate cornices. Rooms to let was the sign upon a tree trunk, and after some doubt and hesitation I went up the terrace steps, crossed the lawn, and rang a bell much newer than its surroundings. Once admitted to the wide, inviting hall, with its glimpse of cheerful dining-room beyond, and a large, cool parlour opening at the side, I felt that Trent might well have sought quarters in this roomy, airy house, and when the lady of the house, a woman small, elderly delicate and refined appeared before me i put my question hopefully madam have you among the inmates of your house a mr gerald trent i saw by her sudden change of countenance that the name was not strange to her and was not surprised when she informed me that a mr trent had engaged her best suite of rooms for himself and four others that he had called upon her on the monday previous paid her an advance upon the rooms, and informed her that his friends would arrive in three days, if not sooner. 
They should have been here she concluded the day before yesterday But they have not appeared and we have had no word from them. It is very inconvenient for me Of course the rooms are secured until Monday But I have no means of knowing if they will come then or when I may consider them at my disposal It was evident that she had not seen the papers and I at once put the notice in her hand and told her the nature of my business There seemed but one opinion of Gerald Trent when she had read the paper and heard my statement She said at once what the inmates of the hotel had said before her Something has happened to him. He never went away like this of his own accord I never saw a more simple and sincere young man and then as if by an afterthought he had too much money about him he was too well dressed and I don't think he was of a suspicious nature I Learned from her very little to help my further search Trent had met none of the guests of the house upon either of his visits there in reply to a question She had said he seemed in the best of spirits when he paid the advance money and went away And he said that he meant to spend the day in the Pleasance. I remember that he laughed when he said this and added something to the effect that he wanted to decide before the ladies came where it would pay to go on the Pleasance, and what were the things they would not care for. He had a rather frank and boyish way of expressing himself. And you think he went from here to the fair? I believe he went from here to Midway Pleasance. There is an entrance on this street, three blocks south, and I walked to the door with him and pointed the way to it. And this was all. Of course, I took from her lips, as from the people uptown, a minute description of Trent's dress and appearance on the day of his disappearance and Then I went back to the fair by the midway gate and wished impatiently for the time to come when I should meet Brainerd and consult with him This I knew would not be until a late hour and as I lounged down the Pleasance, I began to look about for the handsome guard in whom I had taken a decided interest I found him easily as erect soldierly attentive to duty as usual and we spent the greater part of two hours chatting while we paced up and down midway he was a bright talker and he entertained me with a number of amusing incidents graphically related and illustrative of the life on the pleasance during the two hours however i broke the monotony of a continuous tramp by an excursion now on one side and then on the other now to see the glass blowers now the submarine exhibit and lastly to the irish village that clustered about blarney castle it was on my return from this that as i approached him i saw with some surprise that he was in earnest conversation with a woman and as i came nearer and he shifted his position slightly i saw that the woman was none other than that ignis fatuous the brunette her back was toward me and she was squarely facing him so that as I came nearer and directly toward them I caught his eye and Nodding with a gesture which I think he understood I turned away and watched the maneuvers of the little mystery as Brainerd so often called the brunette Wondering if this unknown guard was also to be enmeshed in the plot She seemed to be weaving and then there flashed into my mind that first meeting with the guard and his avowed acquaintance with Miss Jenrys. Was this interview in any way connected with or concerning her? The brunette had not seen me, of that I was quite assured, and even so I had small fear of recognition, for while I had not on the occasion of our two meetings face to face worn any disguise, I was confident that the widely different garments worn on the two occasions together with my ability to elongate twist and change my features and to alter the pitch of my voice was masquerade sufficient but i did not desire to become known to this anomalous personage and i lingered here and there within sight and at a safe distance until i saw her nod airily and trip away flinging a smile over her shoulder in the time spent in waiting the end of this little dialogue i had decided that I must know this young man so reticent yet so frank better and that I must win his confidence and to do this perfect frankness I knew would be my best aid when the mystery was safely out of sight and on this occasion I had no desire to follow her 
I rejoined the guard, and I was sure that I surprised upon his face a look of perplexity and annoyance, which vanished when I put my hand upon his arm, and, falling into step with him, began, I hope you understood my meaning when I went into ambush so suddenly. I really did not care to encounter your friend. That is hardly the right name, seeing that the lady is a stranger to me, he replied, slightly smiling. Indeed, I retorted then may i wager that i know what she had to say to you i saw him flush and his lips compress themselves as if to hold back some hasty speech but i went lightly on that is the young person who claimed the bag belonging to your acquaintance you remember the circumstance and if she is still as angry at me as she was on that day she was doubtless imploring you to run me in and put me in more irons than christopher columbus ever wore Honestly now, am I not right? He was silent and seemed perplexed again, and I promptly changed my tone. If I am mistaken, and if the young woman is someone known to you, I beg your pardon, but remembering how she turned her look upon you on the occasion of that first meeting. One moment, he broke in. It is possible that we have been unjust in this case, and I think I may tell you, without a breach of confidence, what this young lady... I thought he emphasized the lady somewhat, who by the by is a stranger to me, had to say just now. I bowed my assent, lest speech might cause a discussion, and he went on. The young lady, after excusing herself for doing what she termed an unconventional thing in addressing me, asked at once after you. After me? But go on. She spoke of you as the person, I was talking with on the day when her 